The war against hatred. Interesting insight from today's Aliyah. Matot Masay is our Torah portion. This is the third Aliyah of this Torah portion, which actually begins in chapter 32 when the two portions are read together, which is pretty much every year, as far as I know. I'm not aware that they're ever separated. I think they're always together. In any case, this is talking about the war against Midian, and then chapter 32 gets to the request of Reuben and Gad to have a share of the promised land uh, on the other side of the Jordan, which we'll be talking about that. Um, so good morning. Glad you're here. Welcome. Hope you're having a great and beautiful day. Please be sure and subscribe to our channel, like our channel, share it with all of, or like the video, I should say, and share it with all of your friends. We have um, we have a steady flow of new people that are coming to the channel and seeing, um, let me just take a quick peek here, seeing the, the information, which is exciting. I just want to share this with you. Very excited about it because I, I, I it, this has been the case now for the last several months, but as of um, looks like we have somewhere around 130, 140 people who subscribe to this channel. Um, yeah, so 138 people subscribed to the channel uh, this last month, and that's been consistent ever since Passover. So roughly about 140 people <coughs> um, a month who are subscribing to the channel and, you know, coming in contact with this information. It's, and it's, it's amazing. It's great. And so a lot of people, obviously they're coming here, they're hearing things they've never heard before. And there's lots of reasons for that, which many of you already know. And, and the reason they haven't heard it for, before is not because it's crazy or uh, whatever, or not true, it, but, but because the information mm -hmm. has, is contained in ancient Jewish sources that, um, uh, you know, people aren't aware of and people have been told are is evil. You got to remember how you say that evil <clears throat> and and just a host of other, um, you know, just misinformation, lack of historical context, all kinds of stuff. So here on this channel, so I, I say all this for you new people. Uh, what we do here is we actually, uh, pra first of all, we, we, we practice the religion and yes, it was religion that Yeshua practiced, which was, in fact, traditional, <clears throat> you could say Orthodox Judaism, rabbinic Judaism, Pharisaical Judaism. Yeshua absolutely was a Pharisee, by the way. I love to tell, saying that because A, it's true, and B, it's shocking. Uh, but really, the shocking part really is is in, intended to um, help people get on the right path. Because as long as you think the Messiah was not a Pharisee, then you're going to be off the right off the path. And he absolutely was. It's it's an absolute fact. You know what's interesting <clears throat> about that? Um, just real quick is um, I want to give you a verse from the from the Gospels because a lot of people push back on that. No way he was a Pharisee. We talked about this yesterday. He rebuked the Pharisees. No way he's a Pharisee. Why do people, why are people, you tell me in the chat, if you're paying attention, everybody take a sip of coffee or tea or whatever it is you drink. <sighs> tell me in the chat, ladies and gentlemen, why do you think, this is an active class, interactive. Why do you think people push back so hard on the idea that Yeshua is a Pharisee. Why do you think? Put it in the chat, please. I'm going I'm to give you a minute as I turn to the opening commentary of our <clears throat> discussion today. Why do you think? Put it in the chat. This is an interactive class. Why do you think that people push back so hard on the idea that Yeshua was a Pharisee? Why do you think that? Anybody? Sergio, you're on the right track. Who else? He, Sergio, by the way, says, in case you're watching this and you're not reading, because we were told to think so. Peaches, because they don't know what they don't know. That's true. Uh, Shoshana, why would Yeshua rebuke? Because he loved them, etc. That's true. Leah, uh, because it clashes with their theology, psychology, also anti-Semitism. Leah, if you were a guy, I'd say give you a cigar, but 
what what uh, give you a uh, something. <laughs> You're basically right. Milka pride. That's that's also true. Been Roy been trained that way. Yes. Uh, Randy, many reasons. Anti oral troll. Yes. Ariella Roman teaching the opposite. Yes. Basically, y'all are all on the right track here. Let me just let me try to put it in a more condensed fashion. But basically, you're all you're all saying the same thing. Mark need to keep Yeshua separated from Judaism. That is also true, and also on the right track. All those are great answers, actually, every single one, and they're all they're all accurate. Let me just simply say it a little bit different way. <clears throat> People have been mentally conditioned, brainwashed to believe that the Pharisees are the enemy. And the Pharisees, just like all of you have said, and it's true, they represent Judaism. The Pharisees are the Jews. Connie, looking for the scapegoat, that's true too. And so um, the Pharisees were, meant to, people were meant, brainwashed, mentally conditioned to believe that the Pharisees were the enemy, the wicked ones, the, the Jews. Ugh. Judaism. Yeshua didn't come. Somebody wrote into the channel uh, recently. Yeshua didn't come to establish a religion. You're right. He didn't because the religion already existed and he was keeping it. It's a true statement, actually, but the person was approaching it as if Yeshua came to destroy religion, which is, of course, ridiculous. You can't destroy religion, by the way. How many of you believe in God? How many of you have some type of theological system that you live by? some kind of something, even if even in the one you made up, right? Ladies and gentlemen, by definition, words mean things. That is religion. I know. I don't have religion. I have relationship. I get it. I understand why people say that. And, and there and there is there's a psychological truth to that. You know, I I personally do have a relationship with Hashem. Okay. And simultaneously I have religion. In fact, my religion is my relationship, actually. It's important that we actually don't recreate definition of words. How many, how many of you with me on that? Anti-Semitism, Leah, that's true. So it is all anti-Semitism. Um, <laughs> Tirza, been taught wrong and become a nutcase. That's right, Tirza. We don't want to be nutcases. By the way, Tirza, hashtag, you know, coconut curry chicken. Just saying. So here's the deal. Um, so I'm looking for a place for my. I have too many books in front of me. Sorry. Uh, so here's the thing. This is the thing. So people have been mentally conditioned that the Pharisees are the bad guys, and of course they're not taught any type of actual history. They're not taught any type of anything. Right? They don't know anything about anything. They don't know anything about Jews or Judaism, and so they've been taught this. Um. They've been taught that the Pharisees are evil, that Judaism itself is just like a big eye roll. It's a man-made religion, nothing but a bunch of man-made stuff, which none of that is true. It's it's all absolutely 100% false. So therefore, when you say shocking things like Yeshua was, a, in fact, a Pharisee, they're like, no way, but way he was. You know, Josephus writes about the Pharisees and says that they actually, the people loved him. They hated the other guys, but they loved the Pharisees. Yeshua himself said the Pharisees don't need a doctor. They're the well ones. But I really want to tell you all that diatribe to say that in John chapter one, John's part, John, how many believe in the gospel of John? It's right. Okay. So, so John chapter one and verse 26, capitulo uno, verso 26. John actually says to the Pharisees, there is one among you. John actually said, let me say that again. John says to the, he's talking to the Pharisees. John, by the way, also was a Pharisee. How do you know that? Well, because the Pharisees came out to find out if he was the Messiah or not. I can just tell you, historical, you know, this is history matters. Pharisees don't care. If you're not a Pharisee, it doesn't matter. Like, whatever. If you, you can claim whatever you want to claim. If you're not a Pharisee, you're out. Okay, the, number, the first step 
to being the true Messiah was, you got to be a Pharisee. You see, it's true, guys. It's a fact. If he was not a Pharisee, they wouldn't even have given him the time of day. Like, who cares? It's like a raving maniac on the street. No one's going to go, excuse me, are you the president of the United States? Um, so the thing is, is that he, they go out to find out if he's the Messiah. And he tells them, no, I'm not. But there is one among you who is. So we can argue back and forth. Was he a Pharisee? Was he not a Pharisee? I think he was. No, he wasn't. But the thing is, is that John said he was. So pretty much he ends the debate. Would you agree? Thank you, Tirza. Every time, Tirza, I think about coconut curry chicken, I, I dream of your coconut curry chicken. All right. So here we are. And Gad and Reuben want to stay in the territory, which would be basically Ammon and Moab. They want to, they want to kind of stay where they are. We're going to come to this in just a second, but let me start about this, this hatred thing. Oh, that's good coffee. Pete's. All right. So <laughs> the random things you learn on the, uh, Aliyah the day. Aliyah. Daily Aliyah. What coffee do we drink? Pete's. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, <laughs> so, so it said, by the way, oh, okay. I got my tickle box turned over yesterday talking about silly jokes about oatmeal. I want to apologize to the Quakers. Because we believe in historical accuracy here, I made a statement yesterday that was not historically accurate. I got confused. I said that it was the Quakers who did not believe in uh, matrimony and or, you know, male and female uh, cohabitation. I was wrong. <clears throat> it, I actually, it was actually the Shakers, not the Quakers, which you can see the confusion. Um, it was Shakers Village that the Rebbitzin went to many, many years ago in a galaxy far, far away. And we talked about this. So uh, my apologies to the Quakers. Uh, so as it turns out, it was the Shakers and not the Quakers. So uh, somebody corrected me on that after the fact yesterday. And I stand corrected. As I said before, history and facts matter here. We want to make sure that we get those right. And if and when... We get them wrong. We want to make those corrections. Okay. All right. So um, it says in the uh, K.O. Tumash, this is talking about the the end of the War of Midian, which, by the way, in, in, in here, just so you know, in Numbers chapter 31 and verses 21 through 24 is where the laws of koshering dishes are derived from. So just, I think this is important to know that in, in Judaism, we have kosher dishes, naturally. So we have dishes that are um, for dairy and some for meat. And sometimes we have parv dishes that may or may not be the case. It just depends. But um, we the point, in fact, is we have separation of dishes. We have we kosher, as it's called. It's not really kosher. It's called kosher. We kosher dishes. We tovel them as well. We immerse them in water and so forth. We boil them when it comes time. Particularly if you if you buy, let's say you bought a a uh, a metal pan. Uh, let's say you bought a metal pan from a secondhand place, like you're you know somebody had a nice or or a garage sale. You went to a garage sale, somebody had a metal pan, and you're like, you know what, I, I need one of those. Well, you could take it home and you could basically boil, you know, put water in it, boil the water, let it sit for, I don't know. A minute or so, boiling water poured out. Basically, you've koshered that pan. Well, where do those laws derive from? Is that just is it man-made? No, it's not. It's actually from the Torah. What? Yes, Numbers chapter thirty-one, verses twenty-one through twenty-four. That's where the laws of koshering dishes come from. Now, in this though, in, in verse forty-nine, it says, "They said to Moses, Your servant counted the soldiers who are in charge, and not one man." was missing from us. So I just wanted to start out with a commentary to that particular statement in the KO too much, because that's where the title of this class is actually derived from. It says, not one man. It says, the war against Midian 
was a war against baseless hatred and strife. Now, this co commentary here is talking about within our communities, within our various communities, uh, there, there seems to me, and this is just, you know, wisdom guided by experience. It seems to me that <clears throat> the enemy of our souls is very frequently trying to, tries to create uh, strife, hatred between people. And, and of course, the, the whole reason for this is simply disunity. Um, it's interesting because Psalm chapter, uh, you know, 133 talks about that, behold how good and, you know, uh, it is for brothers to dwell together, good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It goes on to say that it's there that the Ruach HaKodesh, that the Shekinah of God resides. Well, what's the there? Well, there is unity. So um, when we are when we are actually living in, in shalom, it doesn't mean you know, and, and by the way, living in unity doesn't necessarily mean 100 percent agreement. You know, we could have differences of opinion on various things, usually it's unimportant things but yet still live in unity, still still be uh, in agreement. Um, but the, the point, in fact, is, is that when we are living in unity, when we are living um, without strife, it's there that the Spirit of God dwells. So it's saying here that the war against Midian was a war against baseless hatred and strife. God commanded us to wage this war constantly in order that hatred, discord, and spite be replaced by brotherly love, concord, and altruism. Isn't it interesting that I love this commentary because it's talking about this, this, we don't, we don't need to just guard against strife, guard against disunity, guard against baseless hatred, we actually need to war against it. Now, I want you to think about what that means. What, what in, in your own mind, what does it mean to, to just kind of guard against something? Like we want to be sure that we don't get into strife and disunity as opposed to warring against it. Now, I don't know about you. For me, I, I tend to think of it in more of a proactive approach. Now, what does that look like? I think that's something that we need to work out. What does it look like to proactively war, if you will, against strife and hatred? Now, maybe that, maybe that looks like going out of our way, making the extra effort to get into unity. You know, one of the best ways in a community to get into unity is to get involved, to be actively involved. Would you agree that if you're, if, because here's the thing, if you're busy working, then you don't have time for all the pettiness. Usually what I see, it, it, what I have seen in, in, in various groups, and in, in not just religiously, but but in the secular world as well. And you tell me if you if you had similar experiences or different experiences. But it seems to me that the people that get into the strife and get into the hatred and blah, 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 they're the ones standing in the corner with their ar arms folded going, well, I'll tell you, blah. Well, if I if it's, if I was in charge here, but I tell you what, if you know, I can't believe I can't. Can you believe the way they're doing this? Is just crazy. I mean, this is just this is this is an abuse of people. I can't believe the way they're doing this. I boy, if I, if it was me, it'd be done differently. And the reason they're running their mouth is because they're not working. They're not doing anything. That when you're busy working, then you're too busy to 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 gripe about stupid things. And then also you're 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 too involved. You you basically are taking ownership of the activity. You're taking ownership of the endeavor. Right? And so therefore you're becoming part of the solution and as you're working if you see something that needs to be corrected, then you make the cor you you start making the correction as opposed to just pointing the finger and talking about how 
how uh, how you would do it differently if you know naturally, of course, if you were in charge. You know. But why? Because you want to be in charge. That's the whole thing. So um, it says here, besides the obvious benefits for us as individuals and as a society, God benefits from this struggle as well. As the Talmudic sage Rabbi Akiva said, brotherly love is the foundation of the entire Torah. Therefore, if, um, or when rather, Yeshua said, you know, love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, Yeshua was affirming the Pharisaical idea of the, of the basis and foundation of the law of Moses. The law of Moses didn't get obliterated be, with, with those two things. The law of Moses, that was the foundation of the law of Moses, which, by the way, was an idea from Hillel the Great, who was one of the great, pun intended, pharisaical leaders, the generation prior to Yeshua. So going back to my thing about you know Yeshua, Yeshua is not a Pharisee. Well, isn't it interesting that he affirmed the pharisaical point of view on one of the most fundamental truths of Phariseeism, which is the law of Moses is based upon love of God and love of man. Isn't it remarkable? For somebody who wasn't a Pharisee, he spent a lot of time affirming pharisaical behavior. Did he call out some hypocrisy? Well, of course. We sometimes will call out people we love. Have you ever called out anybody in your, let me, let me ask you this question. In your family, your immediate family, have you ever called out anybody in your immediate family who was being hypocritical or not true to who they actually are? Anybody? If you did that, I'm going to presume the answer is yes, because I can't imagine anybody saying, you know, I've never actually called anybody out of my family for being a hypocrite or not living up to who they are. Nope, can't ever think of that ever happening. I can't imagine that be the case, but maybe it is. But I'm going to suggest that most of us have done that at some point in our life. We've called out our fathers, our brothers, our mothers, our sisters, our cousins, our uncles and aunts, whatever, for being, hey, you're being hypocritical there. Does that mean that you're not part of the family anymore? I'm no longer part of this family. They were being hypocritical. Therefore, I've excommunicated myself from this family. Is that what happened? Was that your purpose? No. Your purpose was to bring them into right behavior, right? Bring them back to who they actually are. So brotherly love is the foundation of of the entire Torah. That's what Rabbi Akiva was saying. It's one of the foundations, one of the two foundations. We have to love our brothers. Now, brotherly love is talking here really about your community. We're called to be kind to people and to love people in general, but it's really quite impossible, I think, and it's not really realistic to have a sense of brotherly love for the entire world. It's just not realistic. I mean, you can you can have that altruistic point of view, but um, I mean that's fine. It's it's just not it's not reality. But we're talking here about community. He this is talking about the Jewish world in general. You know, loving other Jews, right? That's that's possible. But in turn, I'm 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 trying to bring it home to our community. And by the way, we talked I talked a second ago about being involved. I think this is the, this is why Lapid pride is so important because as you and I are uh appropriately prideful. I don't I don't mean pride in a negative sense, but we're appropriately prideful about Lapid Judaism and and therefore we we wave as it were uh the Lapid, you know, um banner and so forth. Um then this in and of itself creates a sense of unity. Because this is our team. We're on Team Lapide. And listen, guys, this is important. It's important to belong. Would you agree? It's important. It's, it's healthy for you and it's healthy for us. 
individualism, the Lone Ranger religious mentality has got, gotten us nowhere. And a lot of people in certain religious circles uh, attempt to be Lone Rangers within the circle. And that doesn't work. So it says God assures us that in our ongoing war against hatred, just as was the case with the original war against Midian, we will not suffer any losses, physical, spiritual, or even financial. So the thing with this is talking about is that the children of Israel went to war against Midian, and supernaturally, no one was lost. That's the whole point. Not one man was lost. It was a miracle. They went to war and had no casualties. Not, not only did they not have any casualties, they actually... Uh, they actually walked away with 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 the spoils. So the the point here is that when we when you and I make a concerted effort, when we are proactive about warring against strife, then we will not lose anybody in that battle. In fact, we'll only gain. So I, I, my my encouragement to all of us in the Lapid Judaism world, we're 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 getting stronger by the day. You know, by the way, I haven't mentioned uh, for those of you who are watching and you're, you're not aware of our WhatsApp chat community. Um, but we have a a chat group, uh, several in fact, on WhatsApp. We have the general Lapid Judaism community chat, and then we have a men's chat, a women's chat, and we also have an international chat. Uh, and, and, you know, we utilize that for announcements, prayer requests, um, sharing insights, sharing thoughts. It's just been, it's been great. It's in, there's upwards of a close, you know, I don't know, 90 to hundred people on there or something like that. Um, and you can, you can, buy, and you can be a part of that too. If you just, uh, contact Katura, she can send you a link to, uh, jump on that. But the point there is, is that, um, you know, it's, it's a growing movement, and people are getting serious about it. Uh, and you and I need to make every effort to be, to really be in it to win it. This is what Hashem wants. So it's why you're here. It's why I'm here. Uh, and so when we do this, we're actually going to see that we won't lose anyone, but, but we'll, we'll gain. We need to be proactive proactive against the baseless hatred. And so from that topic, going right into the story of Gad and Reuben, they wanted to encamp on the other side of the Jordan. Moses chastised them at first because he, he's concerned that they're making the same mistake that the, pro, that the spies made. And that is that they don't want to. Um, they don't want to go into the promised land, and they assure him that no, 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 that's not the case. In fact, not only is that not the case, but we are going to become the vanguard of of the war to conquer the promised land. And uh, in fact, it talks about Gad. Gad was was a very powerful. Um, warrior tribe. In fact, Deuteronomy 33 20 says, You can recognize those slain by this tribe. They severed the head along with the arm in one blow. So Gad are fierce fighters, and they, they end up becoming the, uh, as I said, the spearhead, if you will, of the army. And so there's, there's a commentary about this in the Kale Tumash, which says, As we've explained below, the war with above rather the war with Midian demonstrates that the proper attitude towards the lower elements of creation is not to shun them, but to elevate them, to reveal their divine dimensions and thereby harness them for promoting holiness in the world. This is what we talked about yesterday. We're, we're not monks. We're not supposed to shun the base things of the world. We're supposed to elevate them. So it says, the tribe of Reuben and Gad, seeing that this is the case, reasoned that the, that, the, that the territory outside of the Holy Land of Israel was of a lower spirituality and therefore settling it and utilizing it for holy purposes would accomplish more than settling the land of Israel. 
For this same reason, they mention their cattle before their children. Animals are a lower form of life than people, and therefore the tribe of Reuben and Gad appreciated the challenge they represented more. Thus, their mistake was the opposite of the mistake of the spies and their generation. The spies disdained becoming involved with materiality, while the tribe of Reuben and Gad overemphasized its importance. So here's the thing about, and this is very interesting because the spies, one of the th commentaries about the spies was that one of the reasons they, they didn't want to go into the land, into the promised land, is because they just wanted to, to remain in the spirituality of the wilderness. Their water is provided for them supernaturally. The manna is provided for them supernaturally. They live under the cloud. They walk on the cloud. You know, it's just it's just like daily miracles. If you go into the land, the manna goes away. The cloud goes away. The water goes away. And you have to actually plant and harvest and dig wells and, you know... Find your own food. It's a really a buzzkill. In other words, you have to start doing something. You have, to, you have to start living. And who wants to do that? It reminds me a great deal of the differences between Judaism and Christianity. Christianity just wants to live in the spirit the whole time. We don't have to do anything. God's just going to do everything for us. We're just All we have to do is sit back and eat grapes, live under the cloud, and JC will forgive our sins, and JC will do this for us, and JC will do that for us. And we don't have to do anything. JC just does it all for us. We just do nothing. We just sit here and go, wow, in this, in this grave. Judaism actually enters into the promise. But in, entering into the promise from the, from the Gentile mind, entering into the promise means you don't do anything. You just, you just sit back on your lawn chair and JC just waits on you hand and foot. He fulfilled the law for you. He didn't just die for you. Oh, no. He did more than that. He lives for you. So that you don't have to live for your for God. He lived for God so that you don't have to. You get to just do nothing. He provides your manna. He's your cosmic Santa Claus. Judaism, on the other hand, moves into the promise. And the promise is, biblically, where we actually live for God. What? Yes. That he's not our cosmic Santa Claus. He's our source. Yes. But we have to actually plant we actually have to water we actually have to harvest we have to do something we have to work we have to dig dig wells does he provide for all of that yes he does and so that's the difference and this and the spies didn't want that the question is is what does god think about it is god for entering into the promise judaism or is he is he for living in the jc does everything for me I mean, wilderness. And the answer, of course, is he was against the spies. And so we have to understand this is the reality. We have to be willing to actually enter into the promise. So their mistake, the spies' mistake was they didn't want to transform the mundane into spirituality. They, in other words, they didn't want to live for the Torah. Remember, well, you, you may not know this, but there was lots of Torah you couldn't do until you got into the promised land. So if, if as another angle of that, another, another part of the prism is if I don't have to go into the promised land, then I don't have to do the law of Moses. So let's just stay right here, shall we? But is that what God wanted? No. At the same time, their approach to the elevation of reality betrayed a certain escapism. The fact that the Levites had been conscripted into the war against Midian had shown them that even those dedicated to the most sublime forms of divine service can and must work to elevate reality. They therefore preferred to be shepherds since this occupation is conducive to a meditative lifestyle and distances a person from the hustle and bustle of life. They felt that it was possible to accomplish God's ends while removed from the realities of civilization. Of course, this is a mistake. Moses initially opposed their proposal since he felt that if the people would enter the land of Israel and capitalize on its inherent superior spirituality, the spiritual energy 
generator would be so great that it would draw into the spiritual potentials the rest of the world. This would make it unnecessary to actively seek out any spiritual pot potential outside the land. So Moses' idea was if we go in and start doing the Torah, then we'll draw the nations into ourselves. But when the but when the tribes of Reuben and Gad point out to Moses that the divine providence indicated that this land was meant for them, it is a land fit for livestock and your servants poss possessive livestock, he agreed that God was in effect offering them the challenge of elevating this region and it was proper for them to accept it. Nonetheless, he stipulated that they first enter the whole land together with the rest of their brethren in order to experience firsthand the purity of life in it. This way they would be properly equipped to retain the force of idealism required when descending to elevate the lower parts of reality. The point there is that we have to be involved in elevating the mundane. And this is what Torah Judaism is actually all about. Why? Well, because Torah Judaism, Torah true Judaism, and Yeshua particularly, enters into every aspect of our life. Here's another little secret, and we'll, we'll end with this, that most this is what most people don't want to admit, but it's true. Why don't people want to follow Torah, actually? What's the real reason? Well, the real reason is because God, through Torah, will be involved in every aspect of your life. Even the most personal things, even the most intimate things. The way in which you eat, the way in which you enjoy intimate relationships, deeply personal things, everyday things. And the reality is we just don't want God to be the boss of us. We really don't. The, the truth of the matter is we would rather, like a two-year-old, put our shoes on our on ourselves, even if that means the shoes are on backwards and we can't really walk. That's the mentality. It's a two-year-old mentality. But that's the truth. The truth is we don't really want God to be in charge of our life. Oh, well, we want him to be in charge in the sense that we want him to be our God. And so therefore, when we do things, you know, we want him to bless it no matter what we do. And of course, naturally, when we get into trouble, we want to have, um, you know, we want to have that opportunity to break the glass in case of emergency. But that's not how Jews think. Jews don't, you know, have God in the break glass in case of emergency shelf. Jewish people invite God to be involved in their life on even the most intimate levels. That's because we don't mind God being the boss of us. We don't mind Hashem being the boss of us. A lot of people have a problem with that. And that really, at the end of the day, is why they don't want to follow Torah true Judaism. That can be fixed. How can it be fixed? It can be fixed by what the prophet Ezekiel said. God, remove my heart of stone and give me a heart of flesh so that I will walk in your precepts. End of our Aliyah today. Thank you so much for being here. Please be sure and subscribe to our channel if you're brand new. Like this video. And listen, if you are brand new, I invite you to, to go onto this channel and check out our playlists because there are playlists there that uh, have been put together purposely. And it's a great place to start to start gaining understanding. Um, so, yeah. So, God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. Look forward to seeing you with God's help tomorrow.